just takes a minute to switch screens here. Hopefully it'll come up. Get up. Um, there is uh, one request I was given to uh, pray, especially uh, this morning. As some of you have seen during the week, um, one of the uh, members of uh, families of our church, the daughter Patience, has been in the hospital with some very high blood sugar. And so they're saying that it's coming down, but we want to pray for her that they'll have wisdom as to what to do for that. Um, we don't want to presume the condition of her ultimately, but um, that it would come down and that God would see fit to um, to make this just a temporary high blood sugar and not something that lasts. Some of us are well aware of what it's like to last. So for me, it started in 1967. So it's been a while. Hopefully she will be over it soon. Lord, we pray for patience for those that are caring for her and for her family, that you would see fit to give her um, recovery and wisdom to those that are treating her. Amen. Well, some of you have been able to see that we have a guest here this morning. Becky's sister, Sally, and her husband, Doug, are here from Tucson, Arizona. Now, I believe it's about 100 degrees there. So today it's really pretty comfortable for them. But they will be going back on Thursday. They're not going to stay here. No, it's no winter for them. But the last time they were here was the end of October five years ago, which was much cooler. So glad they could be here with us this week. Um, just a quick couple of side notes. You'll notice some of the hymns, if you read through, you can kind of get an idea why they're picked out and why they're there. Um, the first one we sang, there's this line at the end of one of the verses that says, spreading his wings for shade uh, to me, uh, that is an idea that's expressed here um, in this chapter about uh, the poetic use of that term to give cover and protection, um, spreading of the wings. And then counting your blessings, as you remember last week as we concluded chapter one, um, Naomi wasn't counting her blessings, she was bitter. But we went through and saw over and over and over again how much the Lord was blessing her, and she was bitter, so bitter that she wasn't able to see it. So that's just a reminder that if you're really feeling sad, you maybe got to just look a little bit closer to see how much blessing there is in your life and count those one by one and see how much God has done. And then the last comment is just an apology. Um, I talked to uh, Doug about this and uh, Every week I try to get the material down to a, a manageable amount, but this is the longest chapter in the book and it's gonna be a little longer today. So just put on your seatbelt and hang in there. So we're in uh, Ruth part four. This is our fourth week. We're looking at today chapter two, which I've titled Ruth's Industry. Um, basically, it's, this is a hardworking woman and she's industrious. She takes initiative. She works hard. So that's the idea of this chapter. All the time when we look at the Bible, we have to keep in mind that we're going to have to think differently and think God's way. We don't read into this what we think. We want to draw out what God is saying. So that's the idea there. 
This is week number four of our study of the book of Ruth. As we review last week's study of Ruth, remember from my wife reminding me that if you want to look at the details, go back and look. I'm not going to review it in great detail, but I'll give a quick summary for those. The overall condition in the book of Ruth was one of everyone doing what was right in their own eyes. There was relative moralism everywhere. People did whatever they thought was right, and there was really nothing uh, good about that. And the Lord says it in the book, the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So that's the summary of what was happening during the time of the book of Ruth. This is the outline of the four chapters and focusing on Ruth's loyalty, her industry, her loyal love, and her blessings. And today we're on chapter two. We looked last week at uh, Ruth, last two weeks at Ruth's loyalty in chapter one. We saw in the days of the judges a famine occurred and a man decided to take his family to Moab. The man died and his two sons married Moabite women. After 10 years, the two sons died, leaving three widows, Naomi, Orpha, and Ruth. Naomi hears that the famine is over and starts to return to Judah. On the way, she asks her two daughters-in-law to return to Moab. Naomi reasons with them, why should you, uh, you should return there and not come with me? And they, uh, they split their, their choices here. Orpha leaves and goes back to Moab, and Ruth clings to Naomi. Ruth gives a beautiful testimony in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, and there's a number of people that have framed those verses on their wall and in places to remind them of how beautiful it is. Naomi and Ruth return to Bethlehem, and Naomi had changed in those 10 years being in Moab. And although the people recognized her, they were dumbfounded as to her appearance. Remember how they were astonished and say, is this Naomi? Well, we've seen in this account the beginning of how the Lord is using Ruth to move Naomi back to the place where she can eventually be spiritually and emotionally healthy. She was bitter. She was not very healthy. Now, this week, we'll see the Lord's additional providence moving circumstances to accomplish his purpose. We're also going to see the beginning of a love story. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. Ruth's industry. The first three verses, Ruth takes the initiative. Now, verse 1. Now, Naomi had a relative of her husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Emelek, whose name was Boaz. Now, the author is introducing us to Boaz for the next phase of the Lord's plan for redemption. Remember, in this book, there's these placeholders or markers where the author will interject something to give us mark points to know where we're at. And here he's introducing the character that will come later in the chapter. He's giving us this to prepare us when Boaz is introduced later that we'll understand why. Well, it's because of these things he's mentioned. He was a relative of her husband. This is technically the term for an acquaintance. Now, some of your Bibles will have kinsmen in here. It's really not that. It's, an acquaint it's a general acquaintance. Um, somehow they're, rela they're related or they know each other or they're familiar. So they're, they're, they're close in some way with the family. And specifically, this man is called a man of great wealth. An expansion of that Hebrew word is a person of means, a mighty man of valor, or a valiant man. That word is very broad in its use. This man is a person of great means, strength, and valor. Basically, the knight on the white horse getting ready to show up on the scene. <laughs> He's of the family of Elimelech. Now, we're not told exactly the relationship of Boaz to Elimelech, but he is called an acquaintance and of the family. Now, this will be important later in this book, when we look at the account of the redemption of Naomi, her land, and Ruth, which happens in part of chapter 3 and then ultimately in chapter 4. So this will be noticed later. We'll see that Naomi recognizes this. Hey, he's an acquaintance. No, he's a relative. He can redeem us. That'll come up later, and you'll see that. His name was Boaz. The name, again, is, means a lot of different things, but basically swift, fleet, and strong. This was his name, and that's what he was like. The author gives us this information prior to relating the actual events in the story. 
By introducing Boaz this way, we know that he's a special person, and it gives us insight unto the events. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain, following one in whose eyes I may find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. Here we see Ruth's submission to Naomi. She didn't just pick up and walk out. She asked Ruth wanting to take the initiative, but Ruth does not want to do this independent of Naomi's permission. She asked for permission. Ruth must have learned about the opportunity to glean from Naomi's teaching earlier. Remember, they had been 10 years in Moab, and Naomi had taught these two daughters-in-law about the Jewish law and the customs, and somewhere in that process, Ruth learned about gleaning. And we'll look at this in detail here in a minute. Then Naomi gives her permission to go. Now Ruth is taking the initiative here to become productive. Note she is not taking the perspective, well, I'll just leave everything in the Lord's hands and hope that he will drop his blessings on us from the sky. Okay? Some people do that, unfortunately. Well, God will bless me. I just need to sit and wait. Now, there's a place for waiting on the Lord, but there's a strong motivation to pick up and get to work. How's the Lord going to bless you if you're sitting still? You can't turn a boat that isn't moving. Those ideas come to mind. You can think about them. So she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. Now we're going to look at this process of gleaning. This is a little bit technical, but I, I hopefully can summarize it quickly. In the uh, Gleaning in the field from the law, here are the main passages to look at. Leviticus and Deuteronomy are the two. There's also other uh, relative uh, important ones, but these are the main ones. The Lord provides in the law in his law, for the needy people using gleaning and leaving the corners of the field and leaving anything dropped alone. And he did this for three categories of people, for foreigners, strangers, and aliens, for the needy and the poor, and for the widows. The Lord provided for them using these mechanisms. Gleaning is the custom of leaving part of the harvest so that what remains might be used for the poor who have little or no means of supporting themselves. From Leviticus 23, When you reap the harvest of your land, moreover, you shall not reap to the very corners of your field, nor gather the gleaning of your harvest. You are to leave them for the needy and the alien. I am the Lord your God. So imagine a field, and around the outside of the field, he said, don't, don't harvest that edge, okay? Don't go to the, leave the corners open, leave the edges open. And oh, by the way, when your reapers are going through and they're cutting all of that stuff down and they're bundling up all the, uh, the barley, if they drop something, don't pick it up and attach it. If you drop something, leave it. That way when others come, they can glean and follow and get something. And she happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who is of the family of Elimelech. She happened to come. The Hebrew here is very pictorial. Her chance chanced upon. It's a double word usage here. English, sometimes they say she happened to. Um, in the old English Bibles, it'll say her hap came upon, hap, H-A-P, like happenstance happened. The author has already introduced Boaz so that we know about him. So now when Ruth happens to come, it's an allusion to the seeming randomness of events in history. There's this illusion that things are random and they just happen. And they're making poetic use of that here to remind us that really underneath it all, God is intervening in all these events in life. Now we move on. Ruth begins her hard work and gets noticed. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, May the Lord be with you. And they said to him, May the Lord bless you. Look at the relationship between Boaz and the reapers. They greet each other with a blessing. Now think about this. 
Is this how your boss greets you each day? Is this how you greet your boss each day? You know, people around the coffee pot are grumbling about the boss, and the boss is ornery, and this and that, and this and that. Rah, 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 rah. They're always like that, right? Some, some places aren't, but there's a lot of that. This is a lot different. This relationship between Boaz and his workers gives us a testimony of how he treats them and how he treats other people. He is genuinely interested in their, you know, their care and concern. Boaz then said to the servant who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? You think that's how he said that? I think it's a little more lively. Whose young woman is this? You know, the, the Hebrew word here for young woman, we'll look at here, but he's curious about this person, so he asked the person in charge, whose young woman is this? Um, let me see if I have... So the word here can be young woman or damsel. It's, a, it's referring primarily to an unmarried gal. Okay? In other words, there is an allusion here to, I'm not just curious about just generally who she is, but there's something there that's attractive. Boaz had many workers in his field, but uh, this one, this young woman, this damsel stood out. It's a loaded question. Something stood out about this young woman, and it got Boaz's attention. Well, the servant in charge of the reapers replied, well, so this is just matter of fact, she is the young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the land of Moab. The first response from the person in charge is just a matter of fact statement. Just the facts, man. He identifies her as the one who came back with Naomi from Moab. Now we saw from the end of chapter 1 that the entire city was aware of their return. So this clearly identified who she was. Everybody knew the lady that came back with Naomi was from Moab. So by doing this, he identified her clearly to Boaz. And then Ruth says, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has remained from the morning until now. She has been sitting in the house for a little while. He relates to Boaz more information about this initial interchange with her. First, she asked for permission to glean. Remember, Ruth asked Naomi for permission to go, and now she's asked for permission to glean. From the morning. This is actually from the break of day. She came from the early morning, and she's been working hard all day, until now, she's taking a bit of a break. We learn a great deal here about Boaz and how he has set up his business. We also learn that Ruth was a hardworking person. This woman was able to come and glean in Boaz's field with the approval of the supervisor. So, obviously, Boaz had set up a standard operating procedure for his business and his land and his fields, to honor the laws regarding gleaning and providing for the needy. He told all the people that were working for him, if a stranger comes, if a needy person comes, treat them well, give them the things that they're allowed to get, and be, be generous. That's the way he operated. Now, not all the people did that in the land. Some of them were very stingy, and they would pick up a little bit here, and they wouldn't leave the, the corners as big as others, and they were pretty stingy. This was a generous man. Then Ruth meets Boaz. Boaz said to Ruth, Listen carefully, my daughter. Do not go glean in another field. Furthermore, do not go from this one, but join my young woman here. Boaz seeks her out, and then he says, Listen carefully. Pay attention. This is a gracious way to say it, but it's firm. Pay attention. This is important. My daughter. This is a term of affection. It's not, hey you, listen. This is, listen carefully, my daughter. A very affectionate greeting to her. Do not go glean in another field. Furthermore, do not go on from this one, but join my young women here. Boaz is beginning to treat her very specially and watching out to provide for and protect her. Keep your eye on the field which they reap. 
and go after them. Indeed, I have ordered the servants not to touch you. When you are thirsty, go to the water jars and drink from what the servants draw. Boaz continues to give Ruth advice and to let her know he's been looking out for her. He tells her to stay focused on staying with his maids. He also lets Ruth know that he's already taken steps to protect her. He doesn't do this after he meets her. Before he meets her, he has already ordered the servants to not touch her. Clearly here we see Boaz has already noticed Ruth before he found out everything about her. Remember, the person in charge of the workers told Boaz who she was. So he, he just saw this woman out there, she was doing stuff, and he already had told people, keep her safe, don't mess around with her. She caught his eyes and his heart already. She wasn't wearing fancy makeup. She wasn't dressed in a big fancy dress. She was working. She was on her hands and knees digging in the field. Okay? That was attractive to him. (laughs) What it takes to attract a guy, you know? Hard work sometimes. He now extends additional help by giving her permission to drink from the special water source. Now, most of the people that were strangers and aliens would come in, and then they would have to pick up and go get water from some other place. This was different. This wasn't in the law. He didn't have to do this, but he told them. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Ruth is overwhelmed by the generosity of Boaz. She prostrates herself out of respect and humility for how she's being treated. Now recall the law had instructed Boaz to allow the needy and foreigner to glean in the fields. That was required. And Boaz is now going well beyond the basic requirements of the law. And she asks, why? Why are you doing this extra? This is really beyond what the law says. What's going on here? Why are you doing this for me? What caught Boaz's attention? What caught his eye? What caught his heart? He just saw her working. She hears a little bit about him, the stories of her caring for Naomi and coming from all these places. What caught it? Boaz says this, All that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me, how you left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and came to a people you did not previously know. A lot caught his eye. Boaz tells her that it was her reputation, her behavior, her loyalty, her seeking refuge from the Lord. It's fully known to me, and I'm attracted to that. Some of Ruth's character may have been in the mind of the writer of Proverbs 31. Now, Proverbs 31 was written after this, so they might have been thinking about Ruth for some of these. She rises while it is still night. She girds herself with strength. She makes her arms strong and does not eat the bread of idleness, among other things. Probably a seed for thought for the writer of Proverbs. So now Boaz summarizes this with a blessing to her. May the Lord reward your work, and may your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Boaz extends to Ruth a blessing from the Lord. He's asking for her work to be fully rewarded, for her to be protected by the Lord. Now seeking shelter and refuge under whose wings, this is a vivid poetic picture of how the Lord actively covers us with his protection. The Lord doesn't flop around and have feathers and wings, but poetically, it's a vivid picture of the protection and cover over a person. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge in the shadow of your wings, is how it's used in Psalm. Then she said, I have found favor in your sight, my Lord, For you have comforted me and indeed have spoken kindly to your servant. Although I'm not like one of your female servants, I'm different. And you're kind to me. 
Ruth recognizes in part what this means, but she doesn't really fully understand it yet. Ruth asked Naomi for permission to go and glean. She also sought a special favor. Verse 2, after one whose sight I may find favor. And then in verse 10, she asks, why have I found favor? And now in verse 13, she has it. I have found favor in your sight. She's found it. Favor, grace, comfort, and consolation, and kindness. Kindness here is a very interesting Hebrew word. It's the idea of understanding. You want somebody to be kind to you. You want them to understand you. Know how you feel. Empathize with you. That's the idea. I really understand how you're feeling. I'm extending kindness to you. I want you to feel that, that I understand and I hear you. That's what she felt from Boaz. He really understands me. Then she eats with Boaz. Kind of have a dinner date now, right? At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here that you may eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and he served her roasted grain and she ate and was satisfied and had some left. They didn't have a little tiny meal like a Burger King or something. This was a feast. At the end of the workday, at mealtime, Boaz comes back to Ruth again. They're having dinner together. She's being served by Boaz. Boaz didn't have one of his servants come and do it. He did it himself. How many can identify with the demonstrated love shown by Boaz serving her? How many of you would like to have some guy take you out to dinner and prepare it himself? Pretty neat, huh? Fun. Some guys like to cook. I'd like to make charcoal (laughs) and carbon, but. Well, when she got up to glean after the dinner, Boaz commanded his servants saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not insult her. Remember, he'd already gone far beyond what the law says, and now he starts piling on, piling on. Boaz goes out of his way to be sure that Ruth will get a bundle of extra food, an extra level of protection. And we'll see how big this bundle is in a minute. Later in verse 9, Boaz, or earlier in verse 9, Boaz commanded his servants not to touch her. Okay? Go back to verse 9, you'll see the word commanded. Indeed, I have commanded the servants not to touch you. Okay? This is before he talked to her. He had already gone around and told all these guys, keep your hands off her. Okay? (laughs) He wasn't messing around. Okay? The power of the boss says, don't mess around with her. Now, he's extending the command, telling them, you know, it isn't that I don't want you to just touch her. I want you to go around and and treat her extra special. Let her glean directly from the harvest. Not just follow along and pick up a few scraps. We're going to do a little bit extra for her. You are to purposely slip out for her some grain from the bundles. You know, you're not not putting them in the bundle. Now you're taking the stuff out of the bundle and throwing it down. Okay? Leave it so she may glean and do not rebuke her. Don't feel like, oh, you're just getting special treatment from the boss. Shut up, he says. Take it out, drop it, and keep going. Boaz continues to look to bless Ruth. He goes far beyond the requirement from the law just to leave the edges of the field. Don't just leave the edges. Now he says, purposely slip out for her some grain. Okay? She doesn't even have to pick it up anymore. It's just basically laying there in a bundle. Boom. Ruth is blessed and tells Naomi about the day. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Remember, she started before the break of dawn and now she's there till the eight, late evening, and she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an FF of barley. Now, we'll find out what that is in a minute. I don't know why they didn't just put it in there, but that's against the way they do it. They just, they're literal. We'll find it out here in a minute. Ruth continues to work hard in the evening. She worked hard all day, and now we begin to see how blessed she was for her hard work. An FF of barley. This is about a bushel of barley. So 
in a volume space, you can think of 35 liters or nine gallons. Nine gallons of barley. Not the stalks, the barley seeds. Okay? Nine gallons picking up scraps. She got more than just the normal scraps. She picked it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. You can see the eyes on Naomi start to go up, right? She took out some and gave Naomi what she had. She brings home all this stuff, nine gallons worth. She takes out a little bit for herself and then puts the rest in front of Naomi and says, yep, this is for you. Ruth returns to Naomi. We see a very strong transformation beginning in Naomi. Remember earlier, she was bitter and sorrowful and sad. Well, something's changing now. The two women talk back and forth about the events of the day. Ruth brings back the, uh, the blessing back, and after she was satisfied, she was able to share the abundance with Naomi. Her mother-in-law then said to her, and I don't know how animated this was, but you can imagine this lady, Naomi, this widow, looking at this blessing. Where did this come from? Well, it's just like she's probably dumbfounded. She starts saying, where did you glean today? I, oh, God, talk to me. Tell me what happened. What happened? Where did you work? What's going on? There's probably 50 questions she wants to answer. May he who took notice of you be blessed. Somebody must have been looking out for you, Ruth. I don't know what it is, but this just doesn't happen normally. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. Naomi is shocked to see how much Ruth had obtained from the day's work. Naomi is strongly curious as to what happened to Ruth. Naomi asks, where did you glean today and where did you work? Ruth says, the name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. Now, what's all this about? Naomi says to her daughter, May he be blessed of the Lord, who has not withdrawn his kindness from the living and from the dead. Again, Naomi said to her, The man is our relative. He is one of our redeemers. Naomi's putting a few things together. Think this old widow, she's starting to think, Boy, something's going on here. Lord, what are you doing? Hi, God, there's something going on here, Lord. You're not messing around. You're doing something here. Naomi's very interested, and the wheels of thought start turning in her head. Just imagine the picture of those cranks and the wheels and the thought and those little popping up. What about this? What about that? How did this? How did that? She is just is so excited about what's going on. The Lord's doing something. Wow. You know, I said I was empty. He's starting to fill things up again. Wow. Naomi said to her, the man is our relative. He is one of our redeemers. She heard who it was. It was Boaz. And Naomi knew her family and her relatives and her relations. She knew all about that. She was a well-known person in the city. Her family was well-known. And the cousins and uncles and aunts and aunts and nieces and nephews and people and the relationships are all over the place. Now, people in Africa consider people part of their family, even if they're not even related. But here, this man is not just an acquaintance, but he's technically a relative. He is actually related to us, which means he can be a redeemer. And we'll find out more about this in the next couple chapters. He is now eligible to be a redeemer. We know who he is. As noted in the opening of the chapter, Boaz is called an acquaintance and also a member of the family of her dead husband. And Naomi is now calculating he's also one of our redeemers. The next chapters will delve into this aspect of redemption for Naomi, for her land, and for Ruth. At this point, the author interjects this. Then Ruth the Moabitess said, Furthermore, he said to me, you are to stay close to my servants until they have finished all my harvest. Ruth continues to give Naomi details of the day. 
saying that Boaz is watching over me and extending his protection and blessing upon me. Naomi then said to her daughter-in-law, Hey, you could just imagine what she's saying here. Hey, this is good, my daughter, that you go out with this young with his young women, so that others do not assault you in another field. This guy is really interested in you. Not just as some foreigner, a stranger, an alien. He's got something interested in you. This is pretty cool. And he's protecting you, and he's watching out for you. Naomi's putting things together and giving Ruth wisdom as to how to continue to be in the place for the most protection and blessing. She can still work hard. She can still seek to do all these hard things for the Lord, but she can do it within the constraints of a place of protection and blessing. Now, it's important for women to be watchful of themselves, where they might be vulnerable and where danger may arise. Naomi's spiritual and emotional health has greatly improved after just one day. Just one day. Sometimes the Lord can do that in our life. He can flip the switch. Not always, but sometimes he does that. So now she stayed close by the young woman of Boaz in order to glean until the end of the barley harvest and the wheat harvest. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Ruth continues to closely follow Naomi and Boaz's advice. He sticks, she sticks with the other women. She goes where she's told to go. She does what she's told to do, and she gets blessed over and over and over again. This continues to the end of the barley harvest and the wheat harvest. All during this time, Ruth lived with Naomi. Now, this is a checkpoint that the author of Ruth is putting in here for, to give us a point of reference for the events. Likely, The daily activity of Ruth continued on like this until the end of the barley and wheat harvest. They met that one day, and then this went on and on and on and on through the barley and wheat harvest. The barley harvest occurred first, followed by the wheat harvest, and this could last for several months, late spring to early summer. The romance is budding. They see each other every day. Every day. Every day. Now, the author doesn't tell us what's happening, but we can imply that somehow Boaz is watching out for her every... Is she here? Yep, she's here. Yep, yep, yep. Get those guys to watch. Every day he's probably doing the same thing. He's watching everybody else, and he's keeping that special eye out for this one girl, this one young woman, this damsel. In his heart, he's got a place for her. The relationship and romance that develops is implied from the account of their first day meeting. They started off strong. And the ongoing activity of Ruth back and forth in the fields of Boaz, with Ruth following the advice of Boaz and Naomi. Note to those who are looking for good advice in relationships. You want an application of what to do in relationships. Follow the advice of other good and wise people. Mother-in-law gave her advice. Boaz gave her advice. She listened, and she was blessed. Follow after those who treat you well with respect and honor in every way. This guy respected her, treated her well. Sometimes, I don't know why people go after people that treat them rotten and abuse them and are mean to them. It's not that way here. Now next week we'll see that after a bit of time, Naomi considers it time for Ruth to make a move. But you'll have to join us next week for that. May God bless the study of his word today.